Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Guiding Star Astrology. It's lovely to be with you for this very special video. We're going to be looking at Christmas and solstice and Saturnalia and all of the exciting things to do with this special time of year. And to do so, I'm joined today by the wonderful David Warner Matheson. Some of you may have seen David in a previous video I did back in September. And it's wonderful to have David back again with us to share his vast amount of knowledge. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Ksenia. It's great to be back. For, um, for those who didn't catch the previous video, uh, David has uh, nine books. He's a wonderful author of nine books on the stars and mythology and many other topics intertwined <laughs> amongst that theme. And he has a fantastic website, Star Myth World, that I highly recommend checking out. It's full of amazing articles all about the stars, all about the myths, and again, many other fabulous topics intertwined there. Um, and also do check out David's YouTube channel, which is full of, again, juicy information all about the stars and the heavens. You will not regret checking that out and subscribing. So, David, we want to talk a bit about solstice today. Perhaps that's a, a good place to start because the sun will move into the sign of Capricorn in tropical astrology uh, on the, I think it's the 21st this year. It changes from the 21st to the 22nd, depending on the year, but it's the 21st, I believe, this year. Um, and that's a, a very pivotal moment in the course of our year, would you like to share a little bit about what a solstice maybe actually is? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks, Ksenia. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back. And I uh, do recommend that people go back and listen to the previous conversation that we had if, if they haven't seen it already, because really, I listened to it again yesterday, just in preparation. And, and we really covered <laughs> everything we covered mm. we covered um you know all of the subjects that i'm going to touch on today although maybe so quickly in some of the instances that we did uh, talk about the three wise men which obviously would have did. tied in very yeah. well with this conversation <laughs> yeah, it does so um you can probably see my slides already but here's here's what i prepared for today <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah, love it. Love it. <laughs> All right. So today, where I am, it's 4th of December. Is it 5th where you are? Yes, it is. I had to <laughs> yeah, stop I'm and think about Saturday. that. <laughs> I'm still on Saturday the 4th. So um, this is this is a, a real a, a, a live feed here of the Earth turning. <laughs> real, time, real time image of the actual Earth. I'm just joking. But... Um, <laughs> Actually, before I talk about the solstice, I, want to, I wanted to start with this quotation. Mm -hmm. And you and I were actually talking about this quotation just briefly the other day. And to set in context everything that we're going to talk about, because I'm going to be talking about some of the celestial foundations of these ancient traditions that we observe at this time of year. And celestial foundations of the ancient scriptures and sacred traditions around the world. And it can seem like maybe I'm trying to diminish the ancient stories. And that's actually the opposite of what I'm doing. It's not, you know, when, when, when I say that the ancient scriptures are based on the stars, some people look at that as saying, oh, you mean to say that it was just for planting crops or just for knowing the seasons, which when you say just, it's reductive, like diminishing. It was, oh, all these ancient scriptures, you know, they were just an almanac to know the seasons. No, that's not at all what they were. But some people have responded that way to the evidence that the ancient scriptures are based on the stars. It's actually something profound and, and very beautiful when you understand this system that they're talking about. So I have a quotation to lead into all of this discussion of the solstices. And this is a very powerful, hard hitting quotation. 
here's a picture of the world. It's turning. We're all on it. There goes California. There's Australia. <laughs> there goes California. There's Australia. But we live in a world that rewards us for being inauthentic. I'll, I'll give you the source of the quotation in a moment. And punishes us for being authentic. These are very hard-hitting words. And we live in a world and a culture that seduces us from our true selves with every possible blandishment, reward, and promise of fulfillment through artificial means. And this is from a speech that was given in 2015, uh, an address given in 2015 by the great healer and Dr. Gabor Mate, who talks about and worked with addiction, men and women who suffer from various addictions in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, in a very, very, uh, like a part of Vancouver that had a very, very high population of men and women who were suffering from addiction. And he realized over the course of a decade of working with and helping different men and women that every single one of them who suffered from addiction had suffered from trauma. And he defines trauma as separation from self. So what he's talking about is that the world itself has a way of separating us from who we are. And that separation causes this angst and this anxiety and depression and it results in all these problems that we're suffering from in our culture, from anxiety, from depression, from addiction, and from all kinds of trauma that is separation from self. So I'm convinced that the ancient myths are actually depicting this for us and showing us the condition of being separated from ourself and the condition of recovery of self. That is what is going on and they're using this incredible system of metaphor to illustrate that for us. So <laughs> that's that's the lead in to what is the solstice? You asked the, <laughs> you asked the simple question, get a, get a big <laughs> long a answer with answer. slides, <laughs> a big, big answer with slides. But now, uh, and, and that part, I just wanna highlight our true selves. This implies that we have an authentic self from whom it is so easy to become alienated. And the world that rewards us for being inauthentic and punishes us for being authentic separates us from that true self. And so the myths are all about the existence of this true self because we don't even know that we've been separated from it. We have this inkling, but it's not something that you hear people talking about every day, right? And the myths point out that we have been separated from, we have a true self, an authentic self, a higher self, or I like to say a deeper self, and we've been separated from it. And the myths illustrate that, and they use this cycle of the year, these cycles that your viewers are so familiar with from astrology as a language to illustrate this concept. So let me jump to the next um, image here of same same world turning you can see it's on an axis there yeah. there's the there's the general line of the equator it doesn't work perfectly because you know this is just a simple spinning gif image file it's great <laughs> yeah. actually but that's generally that's generally the line of the equator right there it slides a little bit <laughs> if you look at it really closely yeah. you say wait a minute the equator's sliding upwards but um <laughs> because we're going around at a tilt. What, is, what, what do you mean we're tilted? Well, we're tilted in relationship to the sun. And this is what causes tropical astrology in the tropics. So here's the sun, let's bring in the sun. There's the sun, it's much smaller than the earth. <laughs> um, obviously this is just on the, on the screen, but- Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is not the real sun, but uh, let, me, uh, let me draw the line of the sun, boom, you see it hitting like a laser pointer, hitting right there in the Pacific Ocean. And if, we're, if that were like a laser pointer burning a line on the earth, 
Look you would get the Australia. line and go, yeah. yeah, it would go right through Australia. <laughs> and that would be the Tropic of Capricorn. Tropic of Capricorn. And so this is when the earth is in a particular relationship to the sun where the tilt is most towards Australia in the Southern hemisphere and the South Pole. It never, the South Pole never points directly at the sun because we'd have to keep tilting even further until yeah. Antarctica was pointing straight towards the sun. But this is where the South Pole is most pointed towards the sun. And so we reach that on a specific day of the year, you've already alluded to it. And the calendar is actually what's slipping around. When we get back to that exact same point, it's the solstice, but because that turning that we're doing, that turning on the axis, we don't turn an exact 365 turns to get back to that exact same point. So the calendar slips around a little bit. We turn like 365.2424 times. So therefore we have to have a leap year yeah. to add an extra day every, if it was 0.25, then you could add an extra day every four years with no problems. But because it's 2424, you have to leave out a leap year and, uh, you know, years that end in double zero, like 2000, no leap year. Oh, Wait, yeah. unless it's, unless it's divisible, there's like all these rules because if, because of, to make it, to keep us from slipping, because what's happening is the calendar is slipping around, but we're coming back to the exact same point of solstice. Wow. Does that make I sense? Didn't, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. So what, yeah. What we're doing is we're adjusting the calendar back to where our re relationship to the sun is. You see, because otherwise, if we didn't adjust it, we would eventually get December 21st in the middle of the summer for us in the Northern Hemisphere. So that, that's what every every time we have a, a year ending in double zero. So every hundred years or so, we have to readjust. Yes, I didn't review the rules. You do you do put it in on a year. I think 2000, you actually did have it. You don't put it, 1900, you don't have it. I made a whole video about this one time. Wow. Oh, well, maybe I could put a link to that video yeah. for people yeah. below. I'll make yeah. a note to do that. <laughs> I wandered into a topic that I wasn't really ready to discuss oh, there, but, that's but a anyway. Fascinating one. Yeah, so what we're, what we're doing is we're adjusting the calendar back to the um, solstice with those leap years. Right. So because we're not turning an exact number of turns to get back to that same relationship with the sun, but because the sun, you know, will eventually travel around to the other side of the earth. Cause we know the sun goes around the earth, right? <laughs> yes. You know, some people, some people think the earth goes around the sun. I don't care, you know, one way or the other, but <laughs> when we get around to the other orientation from the earth, because there, there is an argument to be made that the solar system mechanics is much more complicated than the simple Keplerian model. And I've made a video about that too. Yes. That and that's the sun a, might be binary. That's fascinating. I mean, oh golly, we could probably go into a, a rabbit hole here, but the, yeah. I mean, my understanding of the sun's binary system is with the star Sirius, but your video is actually, and I've done a little bit on, on my channel about that binary system, but your binary system that you're referring to is actually one with Mars, yes? It's not mine really, but I'm, I'm pretty agnostic at this point about this, <laughs> but it's actually, that's the system proposed by Simon Schack mm. and it's called the Tycho's model. And he is giving homage to Tycho Brahe or Tuga Brahe of Denmark, who was Kepler's mentor and yeah. teacher. And so Tycho, had a system, anyway, it's it's quite complex, but- um, How about I put but, a link but, to that video yeah, as well for people yeah, in the description. So we've video. got a link to the leap year um, uh, mechanics and a link to the uh, Tycho Bra. Yes. I'll make but sure what, I include that for everyone. But what we see from the earth, you know, the models that are proposed have to, have to explain what we see from the earth. So whether the yeah. earth is going around the sun or whether there's a more complex binary dance going along, which includes the sun actually going around the earth in a binary companion, it has to explain what we see from the earth. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I've again wandered into a more complex topic than really I wanted to bite off 
at, at this point, but when the earth and the sun are in a relationship such that the earth is most tilted towards the sun, whether that happens because we went around or because the sun in its dance with another star or binary pair went around us, doesn't matter. The effect really, is still the same. What yeah. We, yeah, the effect for our seasons, what we're trying to do with our model is explain what is happening. So again, same laser pointer, look, they're on the same plane here, but now the laser pointer, because we're in a different relationship, is hitting above the equator. Well, I'm being Northern hemisphere centric here in my <laughs> terminology, but up in the Northern part of the earth. And if that was a laser pointer, the laser line would first be going around the back, but then it would, whoops, then it would come around the front of the earth there. So there's our two tropics. So tropic what of is, cancer. that's mm. the Tropic of Cancer. So what is happening? Well, when we are, let's just, pretend that the sun is going around the earth just for ease of explanation explanation and agree to um you know leave that, that one wide open have, to interpretation people, yes <laughs> the vast majority vast majority of people believe that earth is going around the sun but simon shack has presented some astonishing evidence to argue that that model has some problems but anyway if the sun were going around when it gets around to the other side in the in the course of the year, then the northern, the North Pole is tilted most towards the sun and the direct line, the most direct beam gets to its most northern latitude and goes along the Tropic of Cancer. And the reason why it's called the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, we'll get to that in a moment, but those are the two most southern that the direct line will get when the south pole is pointed most towards the sun and the most northern that a direct line will get. Everyone north of that Tropic of Cancer never gets a direct mm. beam 90 degrees down from the sun. Yeah. Everyone south of the Tropic of Capricorn never gets a 90 degree, the sun will never be directly overhead, but it will be within those two tropics and that's why we call them you know, a tropical climate is everywhere in between there yeah. because the sun will be directly overhead beaming straight down. And that's the farthest north and the farthest south that it gets. And so right now we are fast approaching the relationship with the sun that we see on the left of our screen as we're looking at it, where the South Pole is about to get to its most direct, uh, you know, the most tilted towards the sun that it ever gets. Yes. And, and, there, and, and we're getting there. Yeah. And in astrology, uh, tropical astrology, that will be the day that the sun moves into the astrology sign of Capricorn. Hence, the name is the Tropic of Capricorn. And when the sun is moving into um, zero degrees of Cancer, that is uh, when the sun is at that declination of the Tropic of Capric um, Cancer. So there's a lot of ancient mythologies that talk about this movement of the sun between both, um, both tropics. And I, I mentioned one in a video a couple of weeks ago where I talk about Enki and Enlil, Enki representing Tropic of Cancer and, and Enlil rep representing Tropic of Capricorn in the ancient, uh, I believe it was the Mesopotamian, it might have been Sumer, I, I might have it wrong um but yeah there was the the battle between those two was often depicting this celestial movement of of the sun between the tropics which i find quite intriguing and i know that there's more myths and you will know more about the other ones that speak about this movement yes in fact i mean it's that's a perfect segue Ksenia, because the whole ancient system is based on that the whole language that relates to this recovery of self that I alluded to at the beginning has to do, it uses this framework that you just described to, to be like the alphabet or to be like the, the code to describe and to teach us about this separation from self and recovery of self. So there I've labeled our equator. And then as you already said, Tropic of Capricorn, we're approaching the point where the sun will reach its southernmost point when the south pole points most directly towards the sun 
and then Tropic of Cancer. And so the sun, its path, the path of that most direct line is forever going back and forth in between. So I've drawn it going up with a red arrow because again, I'm being Northern Hemisphere centric. That's fine. We're used it'll to it getting, down here. <laughs> yeah, it'll, be, it'll be getting warmer for us as the sun goes along that red arrow. And then when it, it'll get to the Tropic of Cancer and that'll be our midsummer day, the, you know, the summer solstice for us, winter for you, that's the June solstice. Yeah. And it'll turn back around. And I put that in blue because for us in the Northern Hemisphere, days will be getting shorter. Things will start to get colder. And it's the opposite, obviously, for the Southern Hemisphere. So it's coming up. The, the December solstice for the Southern Hemisphere is the middle of the, the season of summer. Yes. For us, it's the middle of winter. And that back and forth is the framework for this entire system that surrounds the ancient myths or that the ancient myths are built upon, actually, as a foundation. And so I just, I'll shade in the tropics here. Yeah, great. Everything in between there, the sun will, will be directly overhead at some point during the year. Everywhere north and south of that, the sun won't be. So those are the tropics. But it's interesting because the tropical astrology and sidereal astrology, it has to do with, well, in, in tropical, let me let me build the rest of the framework and yeah. and, and, and we can um, so as the sun is going around the earth or earth going around the sun doesn't doesn't really matter for this discussion there will be a different background of stars for the sun throughout the year so i'm going to draw in the um kind of as if these are the four walls of a room obviously it's not obviously there wouldn't be corners there but i did that because drawing kind of a a smooth band was harder. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, it but makes the sense. Sun, yeah, the sun is going through as it's going around a different background of stars mm -hmm. as it, as we go through the years, or uh, uh, as we go through the year, the annual cycle, or as this Earth is going around. The line between the Earth and the sun will point to a different constellation as we go through yes. the year. So, so you can imagine that band as being smooth, not having corners like a room and going all the way around behind the computer screen or yeah. smartphone that you're looking at. And, and, and the earth and the sun are doing their dance with the background of stars. And that's what sketches out our zodiac. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just a paper representation of the relationship between the earth and the sun. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in the solstice here in a moment, but the same thing of those two arrows, the, the sun going all the way down to its most southern, southerly point and going all the way up to its most northerly point is actually depicted on this diagram. This is from, I think, 1613. This is a pretty old one. I happen to like it. I know that a lot of astrology diagrams, the motion through the zodiac is depicted as going counterclockwise. I like this one and it goes clockwise, um, but it doesn't matter whether you depict it going clockwise or counterclockwise because the sun's not actually going around that little piece of paper. Yeah, It's going back and forth between those two lines on the earth that we're looking at in the diagram above. This is just trying to show it on a piece of paper so yeah. you could depict that motion going, but this motion is going clockwise. So you can see all your viewers who are so familiar with astrology, obviously probably already picked out yeah. all, the, uh, <laughs> all the signs there, but there's Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. So if, if tropical astrology designates the very first day of, you know, spring equinox happening at one degree of Aries, right? Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So there's Aries. So there's that horizontal line is right where we cross the spring equinox or the March equinox, which for the Northern hemisphere is spring. Yes. And then going around to the top, we get to Gemini. Obviously there's that highest point and then it begins, you know, cancer begins right there between Gemini the and cancer is where we reach that highest point. So I've got I'll to say the in. crab looks a little bit like a scorpion in that. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a lobster. They used yeah. to do like a lobster because you can see Scorpio down there. Yeah, yeah, with its pincers. Yeah, yeah. 
I didn't draw the line to every single one. I figured everybody can figure it out. From, no, no. Yeah. You know, the lines would clutter it up too much because I'm going to draw a few more arrows and things, but you're right. The cancer um, depictions used to look more like a lobster than a crab, but you can see um, your familiar signs of the Zodiac there on the, on the diagram. And so the very same thing that's happening above of the, the sun or the Earth's relationship, you know, causing the sun to move all the way down to the Tropic of Capricorn, all the way up to the Tropic of Cancer, creates these two halves of the year where the days are longer, as I wrote on the top, and days are, nights are longer down at the bottom, or days are shorter, hours of daylight are shorter than hours of darkness down on the bottom. That's Northern Hemisphere centric again. So for the Southern Hemisphere, the lower half that I'm filling in here days are actually longer than nights. Yeah, yeah. So I put it in green because one half of the year is like the lower half of the year. We talked about this last time. That's mm. actually the, the half of the year that represents this incarnate life. So I drew it in green like earth or even yeah. if you imagine like a deep ocean, like the middle of the Atlantic where the ocean might be that color, the lower elements of earth and water and then up above, I did it in blue and put some stars in there to show kind of the, the air and fire, the, the realm of spirit and the heavens. I find this really fascinating, David, because in astrology, um, earth and water, they're the feminine signs. And in um, astrology, the, the fire and air signs are the masculine. And, and it's fascinating to me that there's this, this split here between the two in in this concept that you're presenting mm -hmm. and of course yeah. the earth is considered this feminine mother earth you know so right. to be on earth is this feminine particular energy and and i'm not talking about men and women here i'm you know it's it's an, that's an right essence. it's esoteric mm -hmm. yeah it's esoteric and it's receptive i mean it's it is there is a um, you know a sexual metaphor going on in that the the yeah. pattern that comes down from heaven gets imprinted upon the matter that we're all in. You know, we're all in a physical body that's made of, quote unquote, earth and water, clay, yeah. right? How do you make, you know, the, the ancient myths will talk about Prometheus making men and women out of clay and, yeah. then, and then putting the spark of fire in there. So the clay is the lower elements of earth and water, which we all are the receptive body that we're in is receiving a pattern from the heavens. In fact, you could think of astrology as explaining that, you know, exactly. the patterns from the heavens are being imprinted into our being when we're born. So- And the metaphor of Uranus, the sky god, you know, covering over the, the earth, the mother earth, and they were a couple in the ancient. That's um, right. Which, which fits this illustration. It's beautiful. That's right. Although in the Egyptian, it's actually reversed. I think we, uh, we were talking about the Newt, the sky yeah. god, and yeah. Geb, the, uh, the Newt is the sky goddess, and Geb is the earth god, and uh, they have to be separated because their embrace is so close <laughs> yeah. they, that uh, no life can exist, so Shu is put in between them, and that's the air. So, um, but w what I'm showing here is that we have a, a half of the year where days are shorter and a half of the year where days are longer and those in this ancient system are given it's like a code the upper the upper half of the year is the spirit and realm of the the of spirit and the lower half half is the realm of, that we're in right now this is the realm of incarnation mm -hmm. so we go back and forth between those two but the those two arrows of the red arrow where the sun is going upwards and the blue arrow where the sun is going downwards in relationship to the North Pole, let's say, are on this diagram as well. So there's a point where we get to the very highest point that the, that the earth will, uh, you know, when, that the sun will get relative to the earth, relative to the North Pole, the summer solstice or the June solstice. Yeah. That's right up here, as we already mentioned, in between Gemini and Cancer, where we get the Tropic of Cancer. And then from there, the red, uh, the blue arrow would be going down, right? Because from there, the sun is going further and further south. So for us, it's getting, 
lower and lower in the sky. For you, it's getting higher and higher in the sky. And then there's a shortest day right down here. And then we get a red arrow. So that your two arrows that are on the earth that are depicting what's actually happening in the heavens and in between the earth and the sun, we can imagine them on the zodiac diagram. Days are getting shorter on the blue arrow for yeah. the northern hemisphere, longer with the red arrow. So this whole system and, and these solstice celebrations are tied into this metaphorically. There's, I just, I just drew in cancer to show yeah. why this is the Tropic of Cancer and then Capricorn, why it's the Tropic of, but you've already covered that. So it's when we get down to that lowest, coldest, shortest day of the year for the Northern Hemisphere, we get a turning point and the days are no longer getting shorter anymore. They turn and they start to go back to being longer. That's a very significant, esoterically significant point in the year Yes, where it's like a renewal, a revival of life. Yeah. And the sun uh, stands still for three days at that point. That's right. Um, which is also, there's something very esoteric in that three-day uh, phenomenon, isn't there, that shows up in the myths as well. Um, and, and what I mean by standing still, the sun doesn't actually stand still, but the sun, um, from our calculations on the earth, sort of st stops around, say, the, the, the 20th and reaches its furthest declination on the 21st and then stays there for another day on the 22nd and then begins its move backwards uh, recovering the territory that it's just come from so that's right yeah yeah it's a three-day pause mm, like, that's it's a like better a way to put day it pause um you know it, 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 it's it's really important to what i'm about to go into because you you wanted to touch on saturnalia a little bit mm, mm. and um so that three days it comes into play in so many different ancient myths and references and rituals and, and traditions. So, um, and I, I, I find, I, sorry to interrupt, but I no, find it really interesting about how every month the moon disappears for three days as well. And that ties in to this same esoteric idea also. Sorry. I'll, and uh, I just had to add that. No, that's <laughs> absolutely. And, and so the cycle of the moon actually, um, can, can be used for the same system of it's an esoteric system that has to do with going down into the lower elements yeah. and then having a turn. But see, we are not just earth and water. Even in the Prometheus story, you can see it very clearly. He creates men and women out of clay, but then he brings the spark of fire. So, you know, I noticed you have a Christmas, beautiful Christmas tree behind you there. And, there, you know, there's little tiny candles, uh, you know, flickering all over your Christmas tree. I think yeah. they used to actually put real candles on the Christmas tree, but- Terribly dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but a candle itself is, and Alvin Boyd Kuhn, whom I reference a lot, has said a candle is like a symbol of our dual nature. It has this lump of wax, you know, this, you know, this kind of the gross element, in, gross in its older sense of kind of just, you know, <laughs> flesh but it's but it's also got this flame this the divine spirit uh together so a candle is like a, a symbol of our situation in this life and we we have all these candle traditions associated with that very shortest day of the year for the northern hemisphere but with this turning point because that is the second birth we'll talk about and we mentioned it in the in our previous conversation but this whole this whole back and forth this whole cycling back and forth sets the framework for the for the ancient myths and there's a first birth when we plunge down into this physical incarnation and then there's a second birth that happens at that's this turning point and and that's where we have all these candles and all these traditions and so what, what's this second birth? Is that likened into, uh, you know, in Christian 
uh, our Christian background, you know, you, you're born again, and that has certain ideas about becoming a Christian. But the, the actual real message of, the, of being born again is this second birth that occurs at Christmas time, Saturnalia, solstice. Right. So the whole system is about recovering self mm. and recovering. So when we plunge down into this world, it's traumatic. It's, and it's depicted that way in the myths. When Adam and Eve get thrown out of the Garden of Eden, we talked about it a little bit last time. Yeah. And you said very insightfully, so the heavens are the, the Garden of Eden. So, the, so paradise is the, the heavens is, that, yeah. you know, Adam... Dust from dust you came, unto dust you shall return. So that that when the soul plunges down from that upper realm down into a body, it's like plunging down into the lower realm, yeah, and being thrown out of the realm of spirit, metaphorically speaking. And it's it's uh, there's all kinds of trauma and separation associated with that story in the Adam and Eve story. The man and the woman at first are described in paradise. They're naked and they're unashamed and they're in harmony with nature and they're, they don't have to, you know, but then a fall happens and they're suddenly ashamed of their own body, um, blaming one another. They're, so they're separated from themselves. They're separated from one another, from other men and women, and they're separated from God. They're separated from nature all these separations. And there's a quotation from Dr. Peter Levine, I didn't put it up here, who defines trauma as separation from self, separation from the body, separation from nature, separation from others in the human family. All those separations start off with separation from self. And so I think that healing that separation from self heals the other separations too mm. um, that's so and that's profound. what the myths are showing yeah and and this sort of born again period i know um for me that occurred when i rediscovered or <laughs> i say rediscovered in this lifetime it was the the discovery of astrology for the first time but i'm sure it was a re rediscovery from something i'd known previously but that was when i i, I feel in my lifetime i woke to well my true self loves this stuff and and this is me and i feel like i'm coming home and to me that was uh an apocryphal moment in my life where everything changed and my perception of the world changed my perception of self changed it was very healing so for me that was my born again moment and i'm i, I know you had a similar experience yourself um when things just started to fall into place and make sense at a certain point in life would you say that was your born again moment if we're using this analogy <laughs> well so i think it's really it's really deep what you're saying about astrology for you and like i said i listened to our our conversation again from september last yesterday afternoon and you said you were going through like the valley you know the underworld mm -hmm. you described it as like an underworld experience for you, but then you found. That's right. And that's probably the three day, you well, know, darkness or stillness or whatever. There's that underworld experience that allows you to then be born into the new you. That um, whole lower half. Yeah. See, that whole lower half is the underworld. <laughs> We're going through it right now. And so for me, it was, it was not like a aha moment. It was a struggle. Right. As I saw that the the myths related to the stars, I was perfectly, I was intrigued by and excited by it. The Bible related to the stars, I was very resistant to. Mm. Um, but I just kept seeing more and more evidence. So I had to wrestle with that. Yeah, that would but have been huge. It, 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 was a, it was a long struggle. And also, I would, and I said it last time too, I would caution against kind of thinking like the way that born again is typically used is like you're born again and then everything's perfect after that or everything's, <laughs> but really it's, um, you, you start to recover self, but it's a struggle. It's a long process of, um, 
in uh, back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the myths, I think, depict that for us. But I think what's really beautiful also about what you just said about astrology and really important to bring out is astrology and all the wisdom that you discovered and are exploring is based on this same system exactly that the bible is based on that mm -hmm. all the ancient myths this is all related to the same system and yet you've encountered a lot of you know i know because you've told yeah. me a lot of friction um, lot from of resistance. people about your astrology and it's really unfortunate i know a lot of my viewers a, are the same they have a similar story yeah sorry to interrupt no, no, that's what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, I think it's so important to be able to show that the stories of the Bible are based on this very same system, the very same cycles that you are exploring and observing with astrology are the very same cycles that the ancient myths of the world, the Bible, in conjunction with all the other sacred traditions literally around the globe from every inhabited continent and island on our planet. It connects all of us. So all the different ancient myths are connected by this system. And it's the same cycles that you're observing and talking about and making videos about every day or making your, making your observations about every day. Those are the same cycles that the myths are based on, that the Bible is based on. So... It's very powerful. So what do you think uh, Jesus meant when he said, uh, theoretically said, um, you, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. Well, I think it's all esoteric. And, yeah. and Jesus is actually uh, an image of higher self. Okay. Jesus is an image of the divine twin the the i didn't really the divine twin slides for it yeah what do you the, mean the divine twin because when i think uh, twins i and, and in the context of what we're talking about i think gemini um mm -hmm. but yeah jesus is he I not put, associated with uh, a different constellation well I, so i actually put gemini on our on our yes he yes i can see it right. he is associated with, <laughs> so if you look closely you can see the twins and the twins are there in between, are they on the right side of the earth for viewers at home? And hopefully you're looking at this on a bigger screen than a smartphone, but yeah. um, because it is kind of a busy, uh, and I've got some more to, to transition into, but this is a great question. So Castor and Pollux are twins in ancient Greek myth. Mm -hmm. In Greek, it was called Castor and Polydeuces. But do you know that one of them was immortal and one of them was mortal? No, I didn't. Yeah, so if you look at the actual constellation of Castor and Pollux, and you can see it there, one of the stars is brighter than the other, and it's actually yes. Pollux is brighter, and Castor is dimmer. And in the myth, For those who are looking, um, see the, the, the words Tropic of Cancer, just a little off to the right is a very bright star, and that's, that's the constellation that we're talking about here. Yeah, I should, we should blow it up, and really I should probably just turn the screen off so that it could be us talking, but... Um, the myth of Castor and Pollux, it is, the birth story is that Zeus saw a beautiful mortal queen and wanted to have sex with her, which is a recurring pattern in Greek myth. <laughs> with and Zeus. So, <laughs> yeah, with <laughs> Zeus. And so he goes and um, her name is Leda and uh, she's the queen of Sparta. But he makes sure that her husband comes in <laughs> later on the same night so that there's no, uh -huh. um, you know, <laughs> so that she he doesn't, doesn't get, question the pregnancy. Is that she what? She doesn't get into too much trouble, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> wait a minute, you know. Um, so, and this is a this is a myth pattern that we see over and over in the Greek myths and in other myths. So, oh. one of the twins is born the right, son of Zeus, Zeus, and one is the, her husband. King Tyndarius of Sparta, who's a good king. He's a upright, you know, respected, good warrior, but he's mortal. So Castor is mortal twin, and Polydeuces is the immortal twin. And in the, you know, their story, 
it goes along and eventually Castor gets speared and it, it, you know they're doing all these heroic things. They're these hero twins, but Castor takes a spear through the gut and dies and goes down into the underworld and Polydeuces is just distraught and he goes up to Father Zeus and says, Father Zeus, you know, you're my father. Can't we do anything about this? My brother, he says, no, your brother is mortal. You know, that's the way it works. Um, but because you're my divine twin son, um, Polydeuces, I will give you the option. If you want, you can go down to the underworld and spend half the year there with your brother and bring him up to, um, you can only spend half the time in Olympus and half the time you'll have to be in the underworld down there with your brother in, in the gloom of the underworld. And that is, and, and Polydeuces says, okay, done, that's it. I will, I will share my immortality with him and, and I will take on some of his mortality. And that is a picture of you and me. We are down here in this underworld and we have this divine twin who is spending time down here in this, yeah. in this frustrating place <laughs> because it's a picture of us. We're that candle with, we're the lump of clay that's animated by the fire or the lump of wax in this case. Yeah. And that, and so Jesus is the divine twin. There's a, there's a famous, famous story called Doubting Thomas, mm -hmm. where we're told that Thomas called the twin was not there when Jesus, the risen Lord appeared. This is getting into Easter. So we're at the wrong time of year here, but, <laughs> and the text itself, it's in John, the gospel of John says, Thomas called the twin or Thomas Didymus, the twin. Well, we'll never get told who is his twin. Well, Who's the doubting twin, do you think? The mortal one or the immortal one? The mortal one. The mortal one. Who's his twin? Well, we don't know, but it's the one who heals the, the, the problem, who heals the doubt and who reinstates Thomas or, or restores Thomas to the right relationship. And Thomas eventually says, my Lord and my God, he recognizes Jesus and he gets into the right relationship that's a, actually a picture of our alienation from self, our lower, our different parts of who we are don't want self because they've been wounded by some experience or some trauma. They have buried our authentic self down deep somewhere and they don't want that self coming back. In fact, if you tell somebody, you know, you have a higher self, we talked about this a bit last time too, there's often a, a defensive reaction or a, like a scorning, uh, uh, sarcasm, criticism. That is our different protective parts who are trying to navigate through this world, negotiate the obstacle course of this world as best they can. And they like, don't talk to me about that guy. I put him in the trunk of the car so I could drive. Mm -hmm. And higher self is in the trunk there saying, you know, you're going on this windy mountain road. I really know exactly how to drive, but you don't trust me, do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they're like, don't, you know, shut up about the higher self. I don't want to hear about it because they're, they were hurt at some point by this traumatic experience and suppressed it. Yeah, and that's I'm what this doubting Thomas story is. Sorry. Uh, doubting Th Thomas story is, is, is depicting for us. So, um, I don't know how I got off on that yeah. whole story. You were asking about divine twin. Yes, and that's right. And and Jesus um, saying the only way back to heaven is to be born again. Um, but that's it's very interesting what you're saying because this this trauma that's caused us to shut the higher self in the trunk is often conformity and trying to fit in and trying to survive. You know, so it doesn't when we when people. When we speak about trauma um, in this modern age, people think, oh, you know, abuse that happened in, a, in childhood or um, other, other forms of exploitation and so forth. But 
<laughs> Hello, back again. Um, <laughs> but uh, but really, the trauma is it affects us all because we've all had to suppress who we truly are to be acceptable in this world, to fit in, to get by, to not rock the boat or cause issues in a family, or you know, um, it, just to sort of dampen ourselves down in many ways. And everybody is subjected to that in some way or another. So we've all been traumatized in some way or another, I would say, according to that definition. And I think, you know, I'm not a psychologist, so I always want to make that very clear. But psychologists talk about, well, first of all, we live in a trauma-inducing society. Um, and they also, some psychologists talk about attachment injury. And trauma is a form of attachment injury, which often happens when we're very young. But the fact that the ancient myths are talking about it does argue for what you're saying, that yeah. this is, it is probably possible to have a society that is less trauma-inducing and a society that is more trauma-inducing. In fact, I'm quite certain that we are going, you know, we, we are seeing more and more anxiety, it, it kind of on a, the, the curve is accelerating and depression and addiction. And those kinds of um, addictions are a response to yeah. trauma and and Peter Levine Dr. Levine says we're all affected by trauma just like you said and it, it is so pervasive and it's not it's not helpful to compare one to another and say oh yours was oh no. you were you know physically th because it can be you know, your attachment, a child's attachment to his or her parents is so strong and it's natural, but it, it's so easy to um, feel that, uh, feel a sense of betrayal, even when the parent is doing their very best. Yeah. There, there's a, um, like a letdown. <laughs> oh, I thought my father was so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, perfect. That, and then and, you find and, and, out they're not. <laughs> or, or, or even <coughs> just, um, just when, you know, because of work, you know, he couldn't be there for you when you needed him in some uh, emotional distress that you were going through or, you know, pushed you away. And the myths show this. Yeah. There's a myth from ancient India about Dhruva, who is a child of two mothers, so it's two births again. There's two mothers. He's the child of one mother. And then there's another, the, a king has two wives. And this young Druva climbs up on his father, the king's lap. And the other wife, who happens to be the king's favorite, because she's younger and more beautiful, and she's the newer wife. You know, we see this in the uh, fairy tales too, you know, Cinderella kind of. Uh, but Druva climbs up on his father's lap and the younger wife says, the king's favorite says, get off of his lap, get down from there. You don't belong there. And the king says, what? Nothing. He, he lets the, he lets, because he's, he's, you know, trying to please that younger wife. And she says, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to be there. It just, that is a myth. But look at the attachment injury that is portrayed there. That is exactly what these psychologists of today, these cutting edge psychologists, and it's by no means all psychology that's teaching about this type of trauma that these pioneers like Dr. Gabor Mate, yeah. or Dr. Peter Levine, or Dr. Richard Schwartz that I refer to so much, they are on this cutting edge talking about this as a very pervasive problem. And there it is in that myth where the child climbs up on his father's lap is rebuked for it and then he looks up at his father like you're gonna say it's okay right and he doesn't mm -hmm. attachment injury and then he becomes depressed and he goes to his mother and she says oh this is horrible i'm so sorry that happened you know we're kind of on the outs right now and he wanders off into the forest and then he meets a rishi who teaches him a mantra and the mantra is for calling the god Vishnu. And if you say this mantra enough, and so the child goes and he starts to chant the mantra 
I mean, the, the Rishi is quite, is quite taken by this five-year-old child, you know, who wants to, he's, he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for Vishnu and, um, you know, maybe he can heal the problem. I think that's, the mother says, I'm messing up the story now. The mother says, well, you know, maybe if you go to Vishnu, he'll help you feel better or something. Yeah, and, the, yeah. and the Rishi says, say this mantra. That is a picture of the recovery from the attachment injury comes through the higher self, the, the summoning of the higher self. The, those different gods such as Vishnu and Krishna and Jesus are depicting for us the characteristics of self. Yeah. And so actually those characteristics that we're trying, you know, when, when we're saying, oh, what would Jesus do? And we're trying to imitate them. It doesn't work that way. What, what does work is the more we are in touch with self, the more self displays those characteristics that but when it's the different parts that have locked self in the trunk, trying to do their best, it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so that so beautiful- I'm, Yeah, I've gone all over with that. No, but that it ties back to that beautiful image you were just describing where we plunge down. And for I, from what we've talked about here, that plunge down in from spirit into our human earthly existence is always gonna have an element of trauma to it because that's just life on earth. Um, or life in the body, I should say, in, in the heavy material realm that spirit comes down to. Um, and so I guess part of our journey in the body is to learn to deal with that trauma. And then that's the rebirth and be, be born again to come out the other side and heal our trauma, come back to ourself come and embrace the higher self that wants to jump in the driver's seat for a bit. And I think we all know people who are more, who seem like they're just more in touch with self and more comfortable in their own skin, more yeah. um, living from those, those characteristics of self. Dr. Richard Schwartz talks about the characteristics of self that naturally exhibit, you know, we, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself on, on the description, but we all have these different characteristics, you know, the Zodiac characteristics that, yeah. that you're so familiar with. We all have these different person and we're all a different mixture, but we all have access to this self. Dr. Schwartz talks about our authentic self. The characteristics are pretty much the same across everybody. Compassion, mm -hmm. curiosity. Oh, wow. Okay. Clarity. Those are characteristics of self. When things when we're in self, we're, we're acting with more compassion towards others, more clarity. It, self knows what to do, but these parts that it gets into the whole, we, we, um, we can talk about, you know, the courses, uh, in a little bit, but yeah. the, the, uh, the characteristics of self are universal. Dr. Schwartz, talks about Dr. Richard Schwartz. He's the founder of the internal family systems therapy paradigm. And like I said, I'm not a psychologist. I'm looking at the ancient myths and saying, this is exactly what they're teaching. They're trying to show us, I'm trying to answer your question of, you know, we come down into this lower, what, is, what are the myths? They're trying to help us to get back in touch with self so that we can stop doing this kind of self-sabotage that, yeah. you know, the, or, you know, the, the, the parts that have stuffed the self in the trunk of the car and are trying to drive down that mountain road inevitably don't do it very well. First of all, they're yelling at other drivers, <laughs> they're yelling at the people in the back seat. they're yelling at the rock or the, you know, <laughs> the bump in the road as if that it's going to, and they're cursing the bump in the road. Does the bump in the road hear the curse? No. <laughs> Who is that cursing actually? Who, you know, who are you cursing when you're yelling at a pothole? Yeah. You're, you know, the cursing is actually just going into your own ears. The pothole doesn't hear anything. You're cursing yourself. You're, you're angry at yourself for not seeing it or for not being a better driver or whatever. Self, when, when you're, <laughs> when you're talking to someone who's exhibiting those characteristics, you know, they're not yeah. currently in self, but yeah. we, we can live more and more 
exhibiting those characteristics, but it's not by trying, <laughs> it's by recovering from that trauma. And so the myths are this tremendous resource. They're trying to point us to this truth and they're using this incredible language, this, this metaphor to do that. And so these, that's what we're celebrating or observing at this time of year with Christmas trees and Saturnalia. I've got a slide about Saturnalia. If we have time, we can, we can. There's plenty it, of time. It it. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> okay. So I'll bring that back on, but um, does, uh, that's, you asked about born again. That's, that's how um, we got distracted. <laughs> I went down well, on a tangent. <laughs> hopefully I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm um, struggling to, to say it right, but um, does that, no, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And it and, and answers my question very well, actually. I think um, what we've just discussed here is very important because so much about Christmas and so much about solstice and all these topics that we came together to talk about today, there is such an esoteric message in these things that is often overlooked for the sake of things like this and presents under the tree and eggnog and all the rest of that stuff. And we have forgotten the real essence of the message of this time of year so i think it's great that we talk about this well in the in the symbol you know these are all these rich symbols actually the the tree is a symbol of that the line up between the solstices back up towards higher self it's like the, is the raising raising back up you know there was the tradition of the yule log yes so the yule log they would drag it into the house and make a big yule fire I, I, I should have put a picture of it up, but I, um, I didn't think we'd have time to talk about the Yule log, but the Yule log is like the old dead log. It was actually traditionally made from the previous year's Christmas tree. Right, so they bring know in that. the log, you know, they bring in this big log and burn, burn it at the fire. And then, you know, this year's Christmas tree, you'd save it <laughs> for a year yeah. and season it. And then you would have it as your your big bonfire for the next year. And that's all esoteric symbolism. The, 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 the horizontal is like the dead, like Osiris goes down to the grave, but right. then he gets raised back up. The, the Osiris gets actually encased in a tree, you know, and then the tree gets chopped down and then Isis saves him from inside the tree. She goes looking all over the world in the story she has to find Osiris. He's been murdered by his brother, Set. And then Isis goes and searches for him. That's us, again, searching for our higher self that's been buried and stuffed down in the underworld, encased in a tree. And then she, find, she finally finds the, and turned into the pillar of a house, actually, of a castle or a palace. Oh, wow. She finally, she finally finds Osiris and brings him back. And um, the re- standing back up of Osiris. They call it the Jed column. You know, have you seen the Jed? No. It's like the backbone of Osiris. It's, it's a, I didn't, I didn't prepare any slides for it, but it's a, the backbone of Osiris. It's a symbol. You see it with the Ankh. Oh, yes. Some ancient, ancient Egyptian artifacts. There'll be this um, pillar. It's wider at the base and then it goes up and it'll have these lines and it's, representative of the backbone of Osiris, but the, the pillar was chopped down and then it is raised back up. The, the tree, ah. that's our, our own higher self is yeah. plunged down. These, these myths of gods and goddesses who go down into the underworld are showing that we have this divine self that is indestructible. Self is actually, no matter what kind of trauma that you've been through self is indestructible it's dr schwartz talks about this it's miraculous that and 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 he talks about how this is not what he was taught in medical school when he was training to become a psychologist that everybody has this divine uh higher self obviously they're not going to put it in that language in medical school but he was taught that <laughs> Only a good, positive, structured upbringing will enable people to develop the psychological structures to be, you know, to have these kinds of confidence and, and compassion. The, you know, if you have a very terrible upbringing with lots of trauma, you won't, 
you maybe won't be able to develop those characteristics. And he says, that's what I was taught, mm -hmm. but that's not what, now I'm putting words in his mouth. So you should go listen to Dr. Schwartz um, say it exactly correctly. But basically he says this presence of self, even in, he was dealing with people who had some very severe trauma in their life. And he was dealing with a lot. I've mentioned it last time. He really started to have these kind of epiphanies and he was dealing with teenage girls who had problems like anorexia and cutting themselves and self sabotage of physical harming to themselves. And his training was, you know, they come from very difficult backgrounds, might not have been able to develop these. Every single person has this self that exhibits compassion and clarity and curiosity. It is in everybody. It's indestructible, no matter what you've gone through. That's what I think the myths are showing when Osiris gets cut up into 14 pieces, but Isis can find him and put him back together again. Or Jesus, you know, gets speared in the side and goes down into the grave, but comes back again. Or Persephone goes down into the underworld. Or Inanna goes down into the underworld. So, um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how much. Maybe we should, about that. yeah, pop back to um, your presentation. Um, yeah. Because I think what we've just talked about is very pertinent. And as I mentioned a moment ago, ties in with this lovely symbol um, yeah. that you had. So here's a, a 60s theme painting for you. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I just found this on, uh, on the internet because I couldn't find, I couldn't find one that didn't have the, the watermark at the bottom. So this is for sale people, uh, you know, at Fine Art America. But this is a picture entitled Saturnalia. It's by an artist named Severino Baraldi. He was born in 1930. He's still, still painting. Really? Um, wow. As far as I know. And so, but if you look at when he was born, 1930, you can see why he has kind of a 60s kind of flavor to his, uh, to his aesthetic there. So yeah. this is his depiction of Saturnalia. And what were the traditions of Saturnalia? They involved evergreen trees. You can see the evergreen wreaths. They involved wearing uh, crowns of flowers or uh, evergreen around the, around the head there. You can see it involved a lot of drinking mm -hmm. and partying. It also involved wearing different colored clothing than the Romans would wear <laughs> during the rest oh. of the year. And you can see they're all wearing very colorful um, outfits that uh, were not allowed during the rest of the year or were not considered appropriate during the rest of the year. But it was like party time and it <laughs> lasted... It lasted a whole week and it started on the 17th of December in the ancient calendar. So uh, it also involved like role reversals. So there would be like the master would serve the yeah. uh, servants and the servant would be like the king of Saturn, you know, the king of Saturnalia for a week. And the Lord of Misrule was like, they would pick, they would pick some, you know, really funny someone with a good sense of humor to be the Lord of the, of the party for the week. And there'd be all this, um, you know, excess <laughs> going on. Debauchery and excess. Yeah. yeah. You can see, you know, someone's passed out there and she's pouring wine on him and like, Hey, wake up. We were, <laughs> we were partying a minute ago. Can you, uh... <laughs> but it, but it, it, it ties into the calendar. If it lasts for one week, this ties into your three day pause that you brought up. Mm -hmm. So there's our familiar zodiac diagram. Where will it end if it starts on the 17th of December and lasts for one week? On the 24th. Yeah. So the 24th is, is that the point of winter solstice? No. <laughs> winter solstice usually falls on either the 21st or the 22nd. Yeah. Yeah. The 20th, we, you know, we move the calendar around a little bit to try and keep it there. But most of the time it's on the 21st. So if you might be wondering, well, what's all the fuss about the 24th? Well, if there's a three-day pause yeah. uh, after the 21st, then when does the sun get reborn? Or when does it turn back around? When does the year really have its second birth? At midnight mm. on the 24th. 
because the three day pause after the solstice point, then we get to the midnight was the very lowest point of the earth uh, of the sun, you know, under the earth. Yeah. If, if you're standing somewhere and it's midnight, then the sun is exactly, you know, directly down beneath Below your feet. Your, yeah. That's the lowest, lowest point. And after that, it's all uphill. Mm -hmm. We're going back towards the top of the year. So Saturnalia is like the celebration of all the, you know, the plunge down. Yeah. It's a lot like Halloween as well. Halloween is at 40 days after the equinox. That's the plunge down into the body. See the first birth. So I've got some diagrams here. So 21 December, three day pause brings us to 24 December. Midnight brings us to the sun is at its very lowest point, you know, physically directly under our feet encased in the rock. You know, there are some myths where a god is born out of the rock, out oh. of a, a, a cave um, because on the 24th, because it's midnight on the 24th. That's the lowest point for the Northern Hemisphere. And so that's the second birth. So that's where the red arrow and days start to get longer. So the first birth is at the plunge down into the lower half of the year at the equinox yep. and we have halloween which is a similar festival of all this kind of you know sexual innuendo and dressing up as you know the land of the dead because we're going into the underworld mm -hmm. but it happens 40 days after if you count from september 21st or 22nd 40 days brings you to october 31st yeah, actually which brings you to november 1st the the cross quarter days sort of that's right. halfway between yeah that's right in 40 days so alvin boyd kuhn again argues that 40 days is the is symbolic of the gestation period of a human being 40 weeks in the mother it's yes. really 40 weeks yes. so 40 days after that you know 40 days after that first birth point that crossing point is where we celebrate oh we're in the body we're down here in the underworld we're in the the, and there's a Saturnalian revelry right before this is the you know, right before the arrival of that second birth and mm -hmm. the second birth happens right down there in between Sagittarius and Capricorn and so what they were really celebrating then was this second birth and this the end of the plunge down and the rise into Okay, we're on our way back to summer now. Yeehaw! <laughs> kind of that's thing. right. That's right. Uh -huh. And Saturn actually, Saturn is a god who, in he, he's got a lot of negative connotations. And I'll, I'll show you a. a, a he a does in astrology one. too. He's the great <laughs> malefic. So poor old Saturn. But but Saturn does have a myth where he he actually comes down. He he gives all these civil. He lives among men and women and gives all these civilizing skills like growing grain he's associated you know with his scythe his big uh, you yeah. know scythe or sickle for reaping the grain but he taught these civilizing but then he went away and he actually in some of the myths he goes away to sleep under the ocean in a cave called ojija o-g y-g-i-a ojija the cave underneath the waves so he goes he's buried but he will come back one day. So he presided over a golden age, but then he went and away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then he will come back. I mean, it's the exact same pattern of King Arthur goes to sleep under the lake, right. but he will come back someday. And Jesus will come back someday. It's this pattern of the self that is buried or the divine friend, the divine helper, the divine twin that is buried, but will come back. And so Saturnalia actually evokes that return of the higher self. Can I well, ask I a argue. question? Yes. Um, if Saturn is governing the golden age, and my understanding of the golden age, uh, literalistically, I suppose, is that that is when Sirius and the sun are in their closest proximity to one another in their binary system. And if you're talking about Plato's great year, then that's, um sort of the age of virgo as opposed to what we're in now which is the opposite which is the age of pisces so if saturn was the governing god let's say of the golden age the age of uh, virgo well who is the governing planet of 
the opposite of that, the, the dark age, if you want to call it that, <laughs> according to what you understand from the myths, because the opposite of Saturn to me would seem to be Jupiter, who is the great benefic in astrology. Am I right in to, saying that to get he's back the to you on that. I yeah, don't okay. Know the well, that's a that's you a talk for next there, time. Okay. No, it's a it's a great question. And you know, Walter Cruttenden, we've I think mentioned maybe before, he's the Binary Research Institute. He wrote a book called Lost Star of Myth and Time, and he's I think one of the primary voices for that um, connection of the sun yeah. binary with Sirius having to do with the Plato's ages great. of the golden, yeah, the Plato's great year and the return of the golden age. And uh, so he might be a, a good, uh, a good We'll look into that, that, I think. <laughs> we'll talk about that one next time. <laughs> it's a great question. I, I tend to think of this more in terms of the myths are teaching us about recovery of self. That's really the kind of the, I believe the myths are operating on multiple, multiple levels and they are just full of profound, yeah. positive messages for our lives. I am convinced that this recovery of self is central to their message. I mean, look at the prevalence of twins throughout the Bible, throughout the myths of the world. You know, we mentioned Castor and Pollux, but there's twins in myths around the world and it's not two different people in yeah. my understanding it's teaching us about recovering of our own divine twin that we have access to at all times but we have become estranged and alienated from our own self yeah. so um yeah the 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 ages is really fascinating mm. as well i'm you know i'm certainly open to that as an exciting angle as well and i'm like I said, I think they're operating on these multiple levels at once. Mm -hmm. But even if we're living in the middle of a, you know, the Iron Age or the, you know, the lowest age when we're farthest from Sirius, I do think that we can get back in touch with our own self. I think yeah. that is uh, a worthy, <laughs> a worthy message for them, no matter where we are in that cycle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've talked a bit about Saturnalia. Did you have other, did you want to yeah, this is kind of my last slide. I just wanted to show, um, tie it back because you wanted to kind of maybe bring Ophiuchus in here for your, for your uh, listeners who are like, well, wait a minute, which sign, you know, yeah. does this mean that my sign is not a good sign or, you know, all the signs are good. Yeah. Oh, my sign's on the top half of the year. My sign's on the lower half. Of the year. No, all the signs are, are, this is a, this is a system. This esoteric system is teaching us about recovery of self and teaching us lots of other things too but the esoteric system incorporates the figure of Ophiuchus and I'm going to outline Ophiuchus now mm -hmm. and most people who are aware of astrology are aware of Ophiuchus because of that 13th zodiac sign yeah um, Although there, there's, that, that we touched on I do have a lot of people who are new to astrology who watch my my channel and for those who don't no. Um, the zodiac band in the sky um, is basically the path that the, the, the constellations that the sun moves through, which we discussed earlier, um, as, as the year goes by. But uh, there is one constellation that actually is also uh, crossed by the sun in the path of the sun each year, which is what David is going to talk about now. Um, and it's, <laughs> there is a bit of debate about whether this this particular um, constellation should be included as a 13th zodiac sign. Um, and it falls around about, for those who are interested in tropical astrology, I believe that it falls around about the 20 degree mark of Sagittarius in tropical astrology. And I'm basing that on the placement of the star that makes up the foot of Ophiuchus, which we'll have a look at in just a second. Um, but to me, that's fascinating because around 20 to 20, well, 20 degrees Sagittarius is within orb, the orb of influence that we give to the galactic center of our Milky Way. Um, the, the exact degree of the galactic center is considered to be at 27 degrees of Sagittarius. And in astrology, the, the orb of influence 
is 10 degrees either side of that 27 degree mark in Sagittarius. So obviously Ophiuchus, the foot of Ophiuchus at 20 degrees falls into that orb of influence under the galactic center. So I just, I find this is very interesting. And in the light of what I think you might be going to talk about, David, um, I'll let you take over. We talked a little bit about Ophiuchus last time because Mm -hmm. I think that position as the 13th zodiac or the part of the zodiac, but yet not part of the zodiac, is very telling and very significant. And it relates to, I've, I've become convinced over the last few years of researching this. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, but I didn't, I've been doing this for much longer, you know, 12, 12 or more years now, a little over 12 years now. But it's only in the last few years that I've really started to understand that Ophiuchus is the constellation that most relates to higher self, that most depicts higher self. And so higher self is depicted by a constellation that's in the zodiac mm-hmm. line, and yet it's not, not the zodiac line. We all have these different characteristics, which astrology associates with these different uh, signs and, and angles and that go into making our personality unique. And yet we have this 13th sign that's different from the others. And that is self is not one of our different parts. We all have these multiple yeah. aspects to who we are. Dr. Schwartz and IFS talks about, we have these different parts and Really, they're supposed to be in harmony. They're all different. We all have different gifts. I, we mentioned it a little bit last time. It's fresh in my mind because I just listened to it again yesterday where I said, you know, you might have a very musical talent and yet also be very good at business. And kind of the world doesn't want us to be multiple. And yet we actually all are multiple. It's not a disorder to have multiple personalities. It's actually yeah. reality. Yeah. And yet, oh, You know, you have to be a certain way to be a musician. And if you, you know, if you happen to be very good in the corporate world, then you can't be a true musician or something. No, it's not, it's actually not true. You've got this different mix of all these different gifts, but those different parts of us get pressed into roles that can be not living, living out their gifts because of trauma. Yeah. Dr. Schwartz relates it to like a, a child who's, uh, uh, let's say, a young nine-year-old girl whose mother passes away, and she's the oldest daughter, and she suddenly has to take on the role of the mother for the other kids, and yet she's not ready for that role, but she has to do as best she can. And so our different parts of who we are, because of trauma, can be forced into playing a role that actually they don't really like that role, but they're doing it because they feel like, well, we got to keep this system together or the wheels will come off. And so the, but when self comes back, if, if they would just, that they're trying to do it because they've pushed self down because their trauma has, you pushed self down because of defense of some attachment injury, some deep, uh, betrayal that you felt or some like that story I told about Druva. Yeah. And now these parts are taking on a role of being the protector or being the manager. And Dr. Schwartz talks about these different roles and some roles, the addiction roles are when the manager role that tries to keep everything together can't, you know, when that deep trauma comes back up, then a different part might swoop in and say, Uh oh, here comes that trauma. I'm feeling it boiling back up again. Give me a glass of whiskey right now. I'm going to drink. I'm going to, I'm going to douse it a different way. I was trying to keep everything. I was trying to dress perfectly and do everything exactly the way society said, but now this other part of me will come in. It's almost the exact opposite. Yeah. People say, where did that come from? That guy's so buttoned down, but wait a minute. He just went on this huge bender. What? It's the different parts. They're trying, they're both trying to deal with the same trauma, probably, uh, but in different, almost opposite ways. Anyway, but when self comes back, all those parts can more and more come into harmony, like the symphony 
or like the basketball team where the coach who knows exactly what to do suddenly arrives back and now the players can stop arguing with one another over who gets to take the shot because the coach is now coordinating it and we're in harmony and now they can all exhibit their gifts in yes. a more and they're like oh thank goodness i don't have to be the coach anymore yeah um so that's why the ophiuchus is so important what you just described as being in the zodiac but not, it's not a part is different than the parts we all have different parts and which we gifts. could in astrology represent by the different archetypes of the 12 zodiac signs yeah exactly um, exactly that's why i think it's so astonishing and yet there's this one figure who is not a zodiac sign but is down there with them and yeah. so now let's look at where ophiuchus is because most people have no idea where, where ophiuchus is i mean this is this all gets into um, the diagramming of H.A. Ray, which we touched on briefly last time. But, you know, learning the actual constellations is so important for finding them in the sky and for seeing their different characteristics as they are found in the myths. So let me show, I've got uh, a diagram of Ophiuchus ready for us here. Are you seeing my screen? Yet? No, it's not up yet. There it is. Okay, okay. Um, so this is, I'm looking south from the Northern Hemisphere and you can see the Milky Way if you look kind of closely. I should have brightened it up a little bit. You can do that in Stellarium, but that is the brightest part of the Milky Way that we're looking at, the galactic center that you're talking about. Um, it's right between Sagittarius and Scorpio in the sky, physically in the sky, there it is. That's the brightest part of the Milky Way. That is the galactic center. And now I'm going to outline Ophiuchus. I will outline Sagittarius and Scorpio in a moment, but first we'll start with Ophiuchus. And so that is the outline of Ophiuchus. I'll put the label. It's a central body flanked by two serpent halves is the way it can be mm -hmm. described. The serpent half on the side that says Ophiuchus is typically known as the tail. And then the other side is obviously the head. Can I ask, David, is this why there's so many serpents in ancient mythology because of this reference? Because I know there's Hydra yes. as well. Yes. But Hydra is a bit out of the picture a lot of the time. Um, yes. Certainly when it comes to the Zodiac. So the answer is yes. <laughs> there, well, So yes, this is one of the serpents. There are many serpents in the stars. So right underneath the feet of Ophiuchus, we're going to see in a moment, is wow. Scorpio. And Scorpio plays a serpent-like figure in many myths. So now, you know, I'm not, I'm not an astrologer. I'm, I'm talking about myths here. Yeah, uh, so was I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying that Scorpio uh, people are related to all the monsters that are <laughs> related with Scorpio. But um, Ophiuchus is right above Scorpio. There's also Draco up by the North Pole. That's another serpent. There's also Hydra that you mentioned, which is underneath Virgo, and you can actually see the tail of Hydra slipping away under the horizon in this screenshot. But like you said, I don't actually find too many myths where Hydra plays a role, although Hydra does play a role. Scorpio is the most common serpent I've found, but Ophiuchus figures are often associated with serpents. We talked a little bit last time about how Moses is an Ophiuchus figure and he carries a staff that sometimes turns into a serpent. So you can see Ophiuchus carrying a staff. <laughs> but it's also a serpent. Yeah, and in ancient um, Minoan culture, there was all the, there's been all these statues found of goddesses holding serpents. Two serpents, two serpents yeah. often mm. on either side, just like Ophiuchus there, two mm. squiggly lines on either side and look at Ophiuchus. Yep. So there's Ophiuchus and um, I'll, draw the, I'll draw the rest of the zodiac signs that are visible on this screenshot here. This is from Stellarium that we mentioned in our previous talk too. Oh, but first, well, who could oh. Saturn be? <laughs> here's, a, here's a horrible painting of Saturn. You see this a lot. Saturn devouring his own children. It's in the myths. Um, Kronos in the Greek myths devours Zeus and, and all the rest. Well, Zeus doesn't. He, no, uh, he manages <laughs> to escape. <laughs> Rhea, Rhea gets tired of uh, Kronos eating all the children before. So he, he uh, he's devoured Poseidon. He's devoured... Uh, you know, the older Pluto. brothers of Zeus. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, Pluto or Hades. And then uh, Rhea says, you know what? I'm not going to let Kronos eat this one. And she gives him a, a stone wrapped up in cloth and he devours that instead. And she hides Zeus on a mountain. But um, you notice what he's holding in his other hand? He's holding a baby in one hand and devouring it. Sickle in another. He's holding a sickle in the other hand. Now, if you look at the figure of Ophiuchus, this is a painting by Peter Paul Rubens. I believe he lived from 1577 to 16. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rubens, or, yeah. Yeah. So this was painted in around 1628. So it's a pretty old painting. Do you see the sickle on the upraised hand there? Mm. On the left side of our screen. Now look at the left side of Ophiuchus and the upraised hand of Ophiuchus. Mm. Yeah. Does it look like he's holding anything that could resemble Just a sickle? Very. It's exactly like a big sickle or a scythe. When it's like that long, it's called a scythe usually. And figures associated with Ophiuchus will often carry a spear, often carry a staff because of these two kind of vertical lines on either side of the central body. And sometimes we'll carry a scythe or a sickle. Right. So Ophiuchus is like I said, often a very positive figure, but sometimes Ophiuchus <laughs> will be associated with negative figures too. But Saturn, like I said, is a kind of a, a mixed figure. He's horrible in this depiction, but also benevolent in, in uh, I know not in astrology, but in myth, he does reign over a golden age. He does come down and live with men and women, just like Ophiuchus is down here with the Zodiac, but not quite Part of the zodiac but dwelling among them and he does get suppressed and buried in a cave under the waters only to be promised to come back someday in a golden age and actually the ancients associated um you know that that, that as benevolent so yeah. anyway um and it's like osiris osiris gets uh cut down and cast into the waters and has to be found again and then he will come back and the ancients actually associated him with Dionysus but um, the, the point is that Saturn and Saturnalia is celebrating is pointing to this Ophiuchus figure in myth that is associated with the return of higher self and it's celebrated right around that time of second birth that that right. I was about. Yeah. So let's get that horrible picture off there. <laughs> we'll it's, that. it's actually a brilliantly painted picture, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now let me show some uh, zodiac signs. Oh, before I took it off, I should have uh, pointed out. So this little arc here is a, a beautiful constellation that we can see very easily here in the northern hemisphere. It's probably too far north for you, uh, but it's called the Northern Crown. I'm not sure if you can see it from where you are, but it actually plays a baby in many, many myths, but it also plays a crown. It plays a necklace, a beautiful necklace that will get stolen sometimes in different myths. But remember how they were all wearing garlands in the yes. uh, Saturnalia? So, ah, um, okay. Yeah, and... Um, so this so is the now, garland and here is... A focus representing sort of the Saturn energy here. Yes. And this is the crown. Aha, uh -huh. how wonderful. Yeah, I think that is, uh, I mean, an argument can be made for that. Usually, mm. you know, I like to go to texts and have like two or three points to really back up my arguments, but an argument can be made for that. I'm just putting that in there as a little uh, possible interpretation. So yeah. here's Virgo. That's the outline of Virgo. And I'm just going to outline some of the zodiac constellations so that we can see that path of the sun that you were describing. Yeah. If we know that the, the path of the sun goes through the zodiac, that's the, you know, we started off with those two images of the sun on either side of the earth. That line is going through what the, the line that we see the sun traveling through throughout the year. There's Libra. Next will, of course, be Scorpio. So there's Scorpio underneath the feet of Ophiuchus. We talked about that a little last time in reference to some other ancient sacred stories. There's Sagittarius. And of course, next would come Capricorn. I like to outline it like this. It's a little bit different than H.A. Ray. Two kind of two triangles in the sky. Yeah. It's actually quite a big constellation too, but pretty faint. 
and then we can just barely see the uh, back parts of the running form of Aquarius yeah. there, running away off to the left. So these are, oh, and also you can also see on the, Layout. the right side, yeah, you can see a little tiny bit. Good, good job, Ksenia. You can see a little Leo right there. He's uh, heading behind that tree as, he, as he's sinking off into the west. Mm -hmm. But that pretty well sketches out a line for us of the ecliptic. So that's the path that the sun and the moon and the planets travel along and uh, they'll get as far as nine degrees away from the central line of the sun on either side. So it's like 18 degrees uh, wide, but you see it's going through the foot, as you've said, of Ophiuchus. In fact, and, I think uh, the sun will move through the foot of Ophiuchus uh, on the 12th of December. It hits oh, 20. So coming up. Mm, yeah. So we're almost in a fucus season, if you want to, <laughs> instead of Scorpio or Sagittarius, sorry. Yeah, so, and it is right between Scorpio and Sagittarius. So it's, it's uh, also right along the path of the Milky Way. So the path of the Milky Way is like running across the, the line of the ecliptic. And that I argue is the path of reconnection with higher self and path of reconnection with in the myths. They're, they're using this very complex language and we've, we've kind of laid it out. I hope it, you know, here's my uh, doubting self coming in and second guessing, <laughs> but I hope it was clear enough, but this is, um, this is the framework that the ancient myths are using to help us. If we can start to understand this language, then we can start to see, Oh, this, story is talking about an Ophiuchus figure and it can help us to understand what it's trying to tell us and so there's this passage so to work in the Christmas story at the end this is I'm just finishing up on my slide presentation here there's this passage in Luke chapter 2 about the the birth of Jesus and this this man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and he was very just and devout he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for this promised Messiah and the Holy Ghost was upon him and it was revealed. And you can see the verses down at the bottom, Luke yeah. 2, 25 through 35. And when the parents are bringing the child Jesus, Simeon was there and he recognized that this is the one that he's been waiting for. And he takes him up in his arms and he bless God and says, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And I did a whole video how this is actually also seen in the birth of the Buddha. There's a oh. holy sage named Asita or Asita uh, who comes to the parents and says almost the very same things. He says, this is the one who is going to be a blessing. And now I can finally die. You know, I won't get to see it, but I'm so glad that I got to see him being born. I'm already an old sage now. Anyway, this part I wanted to um, I wanted to highlight. He says to Mary, the mother of the child, Mary, his mother, not Simeon's mother, but Mary, Jesus's mother, is what that his is for. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What, what's that, what's that doing? What is, that? Yes. <laughs> what is all that? Um, this is celestial language. The fall and rising again of many signs in the wheel. You know, the wheel is turning. The, the signs are, the constellations are going up and down. They're falling down underneath the, the equator line or the, the equinox line, they're rising back up above the equinox line. And he even says, and for a sign which shall be spoken again. So it's like the signs in the 12, the 12 groupings of stars. This one, he's the one who's revealing the thoughts of the hearts. This is a prophecy about Jesus and Jesus is associated with Ophiuchus, I draw the uh, cross there. I don't always draw that in, but 
the crucifixion in between two thieves is out is Jesus is associated with Ophiuchus as well as with Aquarius. Sometimes he's separating the sheep from the goats yeah. as Aquarius does, but Aquarius and Ophiuchus are also linked sometimes in the myths. Anyway, Jesus they're like is actors who can take on many roles. Exactly. Kind of, yeah. Exactly yeah. like that. And then there's this part about, he says to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's Mary associated with, do you think? Oh, Virgo. The virgin who gives birth. Look at how she's on her back, like she's just about to give birth. So you can see why Jesus is the son of yes. Mary there. But he says, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. If you look at Virgo, she has a very distinctive outstretched arm. Mm. We talked about it in last time we talked about you know plucking the vindematrix yes exactly good good uh good memory name of the star. <laughs> yeah i think I, I don't know what its buyer designation is but yeah good memory on the the ancient name of that star but that outstretched arm could also be envisioned as a sword oh. piercing through her own side mm -hmm. right you see uh, the ancient myths actually depict sometimes in very graphic language, you know, what's going on with the different constellations. So anyway. They are very was, graphic, aren't they? They didn't yeah, hold they, back. They, yeah. They don't. No, they're, they're not really for children. A lot <laughs> of the things that are going on in the myths, but they're trying to tell us how they're trying to point us towards recovery of self. And I would argue that Jesus depicts all those characteristics of self, including the indestructible characteristic of self, and also compassion is compassion, the, the healing ability, the desire to heal. Self is the one that can heal those traumas. Yeah. And self is the one that is, is capable of revealing what's going on with all the different parts and, and uh, helping them up out of, the, out of the roles that they've gotten stuck in. So. Yeah. Hopefully that all comes together in a nice coherent. It's beautiful. And I, I just, I love how the the sun, as I mentioned, is moving through Ophiuchus during the Christmas period and, uh, and the lead up to Christmas. And, and that, again, is directing us back to this idea of higher self because Ophiuchus is the representation of higher self like you've said, that's been shoved in the boot <laughs> and we have to get it back in the driver's seat. Um, and, and so Christmas is, has this beautiful Christmas season, as we know it now, has the, all these wonderful esoteric connotations that have been lost over the years for the sake, like I said, of, of materialism and so forth. And the other thing that I love is how that foot of Ophiuchus comes in at pretty much the point of the center of the galaxy, which we know, uh, you know, a, a, as the womb of, of creation. You know, it's where all life in the Milky Way has, has spewed out of basically this, the center of it, of, of it all for us. And, and I just think that's a beautiful coincidence as well. That's, um, that's occurred there with, with the placement of Ophiuchus in the sky. Birth. Yeah. And the yes. And, yeah. And in the myths, Sagittarius figures are often present at the second birth. Right. Like, like the goddess goddess Artemis, we could talk about another time. She's oh. present at the birth. I want to talk about it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, we probably yeah, I no, don't know. That was a great that was a great summary you just said, and it's a great point to bring in that galactic center. Where, yeah. Like how did they know? <laughs> how did they know now that's a whole topic of, <laughs> for another time as well <laughs> the uh, are we really as young as we've been led to believe as a as a humanity on the planet but that'll be a whole other can of worms um for everybody who has enjoyed this fabulous discussion with david and thank you for that amazing presentation it was just wonderful david um if you have enjoyed this there is so much more available for you to learn and enjoy with David because David has prepared a fantastic course, a couple of courses actually, one in celestial mechanics and one in the recovery of self. And am I right in the name I'm giving this, uh, a celestial Bible tour? Is that the name of the other, the third course you've, you've got? Yes, that one's still in the works. Yes. <laughs> the, two, the two that you just mentioned are ready right now. So, and, and so actually I've got a, I do have a screen, um, a screen 
shot, but you can go to the Undying Stars. Um, I'm calling it the Undying Stars Academy. My, uh, you have you have my book, the Undying Stars. But um, let me just right show it real quick. Thank you. Um, where did it go? <laughs> Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yeah. So there they are, the, uh, the two courses that are ready right now. These are really the foundational courses, and then we're going to explore all the different myth systems. And so, as you mentioned, I'm going, I've got a celestial Bible tour that will be kind of the first one that will be going through the stories of the Bible. But these two are really helpful as setting the foundations. And a lot of what we talked about you know, now you don't need to take the courses because I just not true, <laughs> not true. I've done uh, this. Well, I'm halfway through the celestial mechanics <laughs> course, and it is fantastic for anyone who's into astrology to do this course because it, it 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 helps give you spatial awareness of what we're actually looking at, and and that is invalu an invaluable tool for anyone who's into astronomy, but also particularly for those of us who are watching this channel who really want to be good astrolog um, astrologers. So I highly recommend it. So well, we haven't you. covered That's everything yeah. in this no, video. No, it, it really <laughs> is quite, it's, quite a, it's quite a complex system that these ancients are using, just like astrology. It's like a bottomless well that you can just keep diving down deeper and deeper and never reach the bottom. So these do try and go, I try and be as systematic and clear as I can. There are, um, you know, several hours worth of videos there. And the uh, I, I've got a special code for your for your viewers. So anyone who's watching can use a coupon code and get twenty percent off. So oh wow, fifty dollars US and then twenty percent off is ten dollars off. So forty dollars US if you're watching this video. That <laughs> or if is you learn about it from Ksenia. So thank you. Uh, That's wonderful yeah. for all yeah. of our viewers. Let me stop sharing. Um, and it's, believe me, like this is this is not just some little one hour course. This is very meaty. In depth it's stuff. like 11 hours. <laughs> yeah, no, it's that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So there's no excuses now, everybody. <laughs> Get in there and, and do the Celestial Mechanics and Recovery of Self course. Fantastic. David, thank you for that generous offer. That's wonderful. Well, I'll give you the code. I don't off the top of my it's Ksenia Guiding Star 101 or something. I have to give you the exact code so you can That's put right. it on the screen when you're putting together the video. Yeah. I'll yeah. give you the exact code. But if if anyone uses that code after and when you're signing up, first you, I think you put in your payment details and then it asks you, do you have a coupon code? And so if you put in this Ksenia code. Then it'll give you 20% off. In the, <laughs> Sounds like the just, sequel to the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> the, the Ksenia Code. Yeah. But it, it, so you get the course for one year. So I make it available for 366 days. So you should be able to get through it in a year. Brilliant. Um, hopefully in less time than that. But I really uh, am excited to announce them on your, on your show. So I've been, oh. uh, been waiting to uh, announce it in. And I feel I really very privileged. Be, yeah, I, I really hope it'll be a blessing to uh, those who watch. I hope you'll find something positive in there uh, that you can apply to your own study of will. astrology in your own life. Thank you, David. Well, this is this has been such a wonderful Christmas video. I want to wish everybody who's watching this happy Christmas, happy solstice, happy Saturnalia. <laughs> and uh, is there anything I've forgotten there? No. <laughs> and thank you for joining us for this uh, tour through these topics with, with uh, David Warner Matheson. Thank you. And we look forward to maybe catching up again in the new year at some point. I hope so. Thank you so much, Ksenia. Thank you. And God bless everyone. <laughs>